Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to to study, to reflect upon your word, to reflect upon how to think about your word, how to read it more precisely, to come to understand it, to research, and to think about the uh, what you have said and how you have said it. And Father, we pray that you'd guide and direct us in, in our assignments and in our thinking. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, what I want to do tonight is I want to start off at Acts 1-8, so let's go ahead and turn to Acts 1-8. Um, and I, but I want to look at the textbook, and especially going, just to go over a few things in terms of the, the reading for this time in chapter 19, uh, 20, 21, things that are emphasized, things that are repeated, things that are related, things that are alike and unlike. Okay, five things, and then... Uh, we'll do some some work in Acts one eight and in in Mark. We'll work on that from ne- for thirty minutes, and then we'll take about um, or about twenty five minutes. Then we'll take a little longer break because I want you to read through the next section, which is uh, or the passage Mark eleven twenty seven to twelve forty four, and do some initial observation and work on that. And then we'll come back and talk about it in the second half. Okay. Um, <clears throat> last time, our, the assignment was to read through uh, at the Hendricks material starting on uh, in chapter 19. And chapter 19, he talks about, starts this section in talking about different things to look for within a section of Scripture. And chapter 19 focuses on things that are emphasized. And as you've heard me say many times, when we read through the, when we think about how the Scripture was originally written in a time when everything was written by hand, by a scribe, and you didn't have things such as boldface or underlining, you didn't have, they didn't have paragraph indentation, they didn't have footnotes, they didn't do a lot of the things that we do today to bring out an uh, emphasis on certain things. They did this through style. They did it in how it was written. They did it through the use of vocabulary. They did it through sentence structure. Uh, both Hebrew and Greek are, um, are languages that are, that are inflected, unlike English. English, you pretty much are confined to a certain word order for the sentence to make sense. But in Greek, for example, you have your, your basically your four cases. Your nominative case identifies the subject of the verb. Your um, uh, uh, genitive indicates ownership, possession. Your accusative case indicates the direct object. And your dative case indicates the indirect object. Now, in English, you would put subject first, then the verb, then usually your indirect object, and then your direct object, and sometimes you can flip those. In Greek, it doesn't matter what the word order is. You can put the verb first, then the indirect object, and then the subject, and then the direct object, or you can put the direct object first, and then the the subject, and then the verb, and then the indirect object, because these parts of speech, these elements within the sentence are indicated by the case of the noun, whether it's nominative, genitive, or accusative. So we look at, we don't have those kind of endings in English. So if you look at a sentence, you look <clears throat> you look for placement to determine who's the subject where the subject is and where the object is and, and that sort of thing. If you've studied foreign languages, uh, Spanish is an inflected language, Latin's an inflected language, it's the same kind of a thing. So instead of um, always sort of having to put things in a certain order for to identify the, the components of the sentence, you can move those components around for emphasis. So if you don't, don't want to emphasize the verb, uh, you can put that at the end, and you can throw the. And if you want to emphasize the, the object, the direct object, you can throw that at the beginning. Uh, sometimes, uh, if you're if you're just using a pronoun like he, he said, which in <clears throat> in um, um, in Greek would be uh, uh, lege, um You have a, a third person singular ending. 
you don't have to put a pronoun there. You don't have to indicate uh, the, the he. Just, just the verb itself means he said. But if you put the pronoun there also, then that shows that the writer really is emphasizing something about the, the, the person who is speaking. Okay, so that's how they would bring out things for, uh, for emphasis. Another way in which they would bring out things for emphasis would be how much space uh, might be uh, apportioned to, to something. And, um, you know, Hendricks gives the example. I thought some of you who've really been paying attention to and gone, th- gone through a lot of studies with me would find some of the illustrations that he used in the ch- chapter somewhat familiar. One that I hadn't run across, or a statistic I hadn't run across, was what he uses on page uh, my book, 144, that Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew has 1,062 verses. And of those 1,062 verses, 342 of them are giving discourses from the Lord. So that's a third of the space in Matthew is given to recording direct teaching from the Lord. And that's huge. That's an emphasis in Matthew, and one of his emphases is what exactly the Lord taught, less so than narrative. So uh, he has a larger percentage of the total amount of space in Matthew given to, um, I mean, he has greater space given to, to the words of our Lord than any of the other Gospels, percentage-wise. So that's, that's an interesting thing to note in terms of, is, of emphasis. Uh, other places, Ephesians is very well known for this kind of a structure. In Ephesians 1 through 4, it's uh, usually what you'll read is like Hendricks will say, that's doctrinal. One of the things that, that you, will rec- you will see as you study is in, in what I would call sort of traditional Christian literature, they will use the term doctrinal in a way that's a little different from the way we use it, and that is a lit- might be a little confusing. They use doctrine to refer more to uh, sort of theological instruction as opposed to application. And so, but that's not how we use it. We get the, the way in which we use the word doctrine is much like how the military uses the, way, the word doctrine, which is not in terms of we're talking about some sort of uh, 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 theologically abstract or philosophically abstract principles. It it, it is talking about uh, instruction or policy that goes from from its inception in terms of perhaps theoretical thought all the way to how something is finally applied in the nuts and bolts of the machinery on the battlefield in terms of its application. So it's not just talking about uh, the way a lot of uh, theologians use the word doctrine is just to refer to theology, okay? But, but in the way we use it, we refer to it, use it to describe not only the theology, but also application, because we don't see a, a disjunction between that. That's how the military uses the word, uh, the word doctrine. And they'll have various uh, doctrine, um, you know, military doctrine related to uh, battlefield application. And, and for example, how to uh, handle I- IEDs in, um, in Afghanistan. <clears throat> it's going to relate to the armament of, of various uh, uh, vehicles. And it's going to start off from the very inception with the engineering, the design, and it'll start off with, with looking at how much armor needs to be on the, on the vehicles. And all of this is in the design or, or the, the, theoretical phase. And then it, but it works itself all the way down to how it actually functions and operates in a battlefield scenario in, in, on the ground in Afghanistan. So it's not only talking about sort of the, what we might call the abstract principles, but it also how it works in real life. Now, that's, that's how we use the word doctrine. That is not how a lot of people use the word doctrine. So when Hendricks is writing here, on, uh, he says, in the epistles of Paul, we frequently find a section of doctrine followed by a section of practical application. See how he makes a distinction? And I always resisted that, mostly because of the background, but it, it's as if doctrine isn't practical. 
And see that that is a, that that's a real attack on on doctrine because the word doctrine, as we as we get it in English from the King James, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for doctrine. A doctrine includes its teaching. It's just the word there in Greek, didaskalos, meaning instruction. And instruction isn't just theoretical or, or theological. It's how to do things and why you do things the way they, you do them. So anyway, Ephesians 1 through 3 talks about what God has done for us. It talks about uh, the plan of God in chapter 1. It talks specifically about salvation in chapter 2. And in chapter 3, it gets into... Um, some of the aspects related to the body of Christ. Then the implications of that is what's covered in chapters 4 through 6. So you see, again, there's a um, you know a pattern there in terms of, of emphasis. Another way that things are emphasized is clear statement of purpose. Uh, he cites John 20, 30. These are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you might have life in his name. So you have clear statements uh, of purpose. He um, also looks at, at Proverbs and the in opening uh, verses of Proverbs 1, 2 through 6, which talk about the purpose of Proverbs, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, etc. This all gives purpose. So uh, that's important. Another way in which, uh, <clears throat> in which emphasis is giving is in order. Order and that order can be given in different ways. Um, one one way it, he gives an illustration from Luke in Luke six uh, fourteen to sixteen, where Luke records the disciples and he and and uh, Hendrick says, look at the order. Starts off Peter and Andrew, James and John. Now, what's significant about the about those? Just right off the bat, anything strike you there? They're two sets of brothers, and uh, Peter, James, and John are the closest of the disciples to Jesus. So he starts with the ones who are uh, more known and who are closer to the Lord and who are the earliest ones that we know of that were called to be disciples. So he goes on, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. Who's the last one mentioned? Judas Iscariot. So there, there seems to be an order there from those who were closest to the Lord and the most intimate with him to the one who is furthest away from him. Uh, you also look for things in terms of, uh, of movement in a list, mo- moving from the greater to the lesser, from the lesser to the greater, uh, and, and things like that. And he gives an illustration then from Acts 1.8. So if we look at Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you, shall be my wit- and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. What do you see there in terms of order? Yeah, there's, there's clear movement in the location from Jerusalem, which is where they are, to Judea and Samaria, which is the, actually, just as a side note, that's the historical name for, for most of the land of Israel. Uh, today we call, we don't call it Samaria or Judea because that's, most of that is what's within what is called for, the, for many wrong reasons, the West Bank. Uh, the West Bank was a manufactured name that occurred once. Uh, Jordan conquered uh, in 1948, seized land west of the Jordan River. Uh, before that, uh, Jordan was known as Transjordan. That's the land across the Jordan. But once once uh, they captured and, and illegally took this land west of the Jordan, and no nation on earth recognized their right to that that land uh, east uh, west of the Jordan, uh, but once they had land west of the Jordan, they couldn't call themselves Transjordan anymore because they were claiming land on both sides. So they referred to themselves simply as Jordan. That's when they changed their name to the uh, Kingdom of Jordan. And when they took land on the west side of the Jordan, they called it the West Bank. West Bank. 
So when we use the term West Bank today, we're, we're you know, I, I got in a discussion with, a, with a, an archaeologist who was in, in a difficult situation because he was sending out his letter to dealing with Palestinians and Arabs and Christians and everybody, and he used politically correct terms. And I challenged him. I said, you can't do that. He said, well, I don't want to get into politics. I said, every term, whether you call it West Bank or Samaria and Judea, you're buying into a political framework. There's no neutral terminology here unless you just want to stick with historical terminology, uh, which is what you should do, which is the biblical terminology. So Judea and Samaria, Samaria is the area north of Jerusalem, and Judea is the area south of Jerusalem. So you're working out from Jerusalem and then to the uttermost part of the earth. So there's order there. Um, Is there any other order or progression in the verse? Okay, first you receive power, then you will be my witnesses. So there's a there's an order there. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and you, you, that's sort of implied there, um, but it's not nece- it's not stated. I mean, once you get out of Israel, but you you could you still have Jewish communities in the diaspora that are spread everywhere. Okay, chapter twenty talks about things that are repeated. Things that are repeated gives examples, like a very famous one is Psalm 136. If you've ever read that, every, there's a statement of a line, and then it says, for the uh, God's love endures forever. Then there's another statement, and then God's love endures forever. And this was, this was written to be sung antiphonally uh, as the choir would sing one, one line, then the congregation would repeat back, his love endures forever. And so you have... Uh, uh, 26 times there's a repetition of the phrase his love endures forever well what does that tell you what's the psalmist trying to say his love endures forever so emphasis communicates uh, a repetition emphasizes something you also have examples like in Hebrews 11 uh, by faith Adam by faith Noah by faith Abraham by faith and after you've read that about 15 times you understand that that's something that um, the writers uh, emphasizing. Also, you, you can see this in terms of um, this isn't repetition. This is more back in the first chapter, an example in proportion. In Genesis one to eleven, you cover Adam and and Noah, and you cover about two thousand years of history. And then from Genesis twelve to Genesis forty, you cover four basic characters: Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, and then Joseph. And it covers a period of about 400 years. So where's the, where's the significance in the book of Genesis? It's on, you know, all of a sudden there's that slowing down, looking at four, uh, four people over a period of about 400 years. Um, Other things to look for is, <clears throat> you know, patterns that are repeated, things, things of that nature. Uh, chapter 21, he talks about things that are related. Uh, movement from either the whole to the parts where you're talking about something broad in general down to something specific. He gives an illustration from uh, Matthew 6, 1, uh, beginning, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them, if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then he moves from that general statement down into uh, three specific uh, areas of illustration, giving, praying, and then fasting. So there's a movement from the general to the specific. Uh, also, we have questions of, uh, another way is question and answer or dialogue, other ways to look at how things are related uh, as well as cause and effect. Chapter 22 talks about things that are alike and things that are unalike, and this brings in figures of speech, similes, and metaphors. A simile is when you compare, one, both of them are comparing one thing to another to bring out uh, some sort of emphasis. For example, uh, the leaders of congregations are called shepherds. 
But what does a leader of a congregation have to do with a shepherd? What's the point of commonality? There are lots of things that a shepherd does with sheep. And there are a lot of, but not all of them apply. Um, Gene Brown, you all know Gene. Gene has, has had sheep, done a lot of, has done some sheep farming. But it's really interesting to talk to somebody who has dealt with sheep because there are a lot of things they have to do because sheep are very, very stupid. And a shepherd has to take care of a lot of things. He has to pick, you know, go in there and look for fleas and parasites and, you know, all kinds of things you really, you know, that aren't really very nice. And, uh, but, he, but if the shepherd isn't taking care of all of those things, you know, everything from cavity searches to whatnot, but none of that applies to what a pastor does, okay? So there's only one area there, and that has to do with leading sheep to food and making sure they have the right diet and protecting them from, from enemies from the outside. So the scripture doesn't, when it, scripture says the leader of a congregation is like a shepherd, it's not in every category. It's just one, uh, one thing. Um, you have statements like the fact that, um, uh, you know, salvation wipes away our sins so that we're white as snow. So that that restricts the comparison. Not every characteristic of snow would apply. It's just one area where there's going to be a comparison. So sometimes it's important to, when there, you see a comparison, whether it's a stated comparison, where like, the word like or as is used, or whether it's a, an implied comparison, uh, where Jesus says, I, I am the vine, you are the branches. That's, a, that's an implied comparison. Well, in what way is Jesus like a vine, and in what way are we like branches? So you, that, you have to look at that. And one of the most important things I found very helpful in understanding uh, some of the things said in John 15 about uh, vines and branches was that there was a class, not a classmate of mine, but a guy who came through, I think it was a couple of years after me from at Dallas, um, wrote some exceptional articles on John 15 in the uh, that came out in the Dallas Journal in the in the 80s, and he act before he went to seminary he had his master's degree in viticulture from Texas A and M. So this guy had gone back and and studied and investigated all of the practices. Uh, of viticulture and and the growing of grapes and wines and the kinds of grapes and all these different f- facets uh, from writings in the first century and and that era to understand what those practices were and how they did it and then bringing that information to bear on understanding these things that Jesus is saying in John 15 because he's speaking to an audience who would have some understanding of that, and so that really opens up the text. So understanding things like that are very, are very helpful. As, <clears throat> so we have things that, uh, similes, metaphors, things that are compared positively, things that are contrasted, and then another point that he brings out here is irony and even sarcasm, which is sometimes difficult to catch in a uh, in something that's being being written. Okay, so you guys work through those chapters. Any any questions that you might have as a as a um, in response to that? Anybody have any questions? Yeah, Jeff. Hey, what are the rules for um, when you're when you're trying to limit assembly? Right. So. Right. The pastor is like the shepherd. How did you come up with those limitations? You look at how the how that is used in Scripture, where you have specific statements given. Uh, for example, in um, John twenty, uh, excuse me, John twenty one, when Jesus is talking to Peter and has that interchange, "If you love me, you feed my sheep," and you can just look at at the terms that are there and how they're used, looking at other passages or giving directives to pastors as to what they're supposed to do. That Usually, 
in a because what you have with a figure of speech is a non-literal passage. It's using a figure of speech to communicate something, uh, and you compare that to where you have um, other uses of the terms in a more straight literal usage. That's how you come up with it. And and sometimes you don't have as much. Sometimes you just have to you have to study. Um, you know when you a, a really fun passage on that, and I wish I could find this. I've had it in the past, and I, I keep losing it. But somebody years ago there was there used to be people called it a, a magazine. It was like a Christian Mad magazine. It was a real. Um, uh, spoof type magazine called the Wit- Wittenberg Door, and somebody drew a a picture of the uh, beloved woman in Song of Solomon. Okay, where you where where you take each simile or each metaphor as if it's literal. Okay, you have dove's eyes behind your veil. So she's got these two little doves. Uh, your hair is like a flock of goats. So there's all these goats coming down off of her, off of her head. Um, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep. So she's got all these little shorn sheep in her mouth. Um, <clears throat> uh, your lips are like a strand of scarlet. So she just has a you know, scarlet thread for for her lips. Uh, your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. So she had these two ha- pomegranate halves on her on her temples. So it's a it's a hilarious picture, but it, it's really great f- tool for visualizing that how we in everyday English we, our language is loaded with metaphors and similes and idioms of that nature but we've grown up with English as a first language so our minds automatically filter those things and it may be a figure of speech but it's com- and, and in that sense it's not literal but it has a literal meaning it has a specific meaning so that it do- can't just mean whatever somebody uh, wants it to mean these non literal phrases have literal significance have a specific uh, specific meaning so um, you know and the uh, one I like is your neck is like the tower of David, you know rocky, bumpy, stony you know that just really uh, but that 's not the the point isn 't what it looks like as something that is tall and symmetrical and uh, statuesque. So that's the point of the imagery. So it's important to go through and look at these things. And and a lot of uh, metaphors and a lot of similes are things that you can look up and you can say, okay, your temples are like like a piece of pomegranate. Well, in what sense is it like pomegranate? Shape, size, color, what way would th- what what would be the point of comparison? It would be color, red like pomegranate. The temp- her temples were red like pomegranate. Um, th- things like that. So it's going through and looking at these uh, at these kinds of things. Okay, we're going to take a couple of minutes just briefly to look at Acts one eight a little bit uh, for uh, observation, just as a review, because I'm going to give you a broader assignment here to begin during the break. Acts 1.8. It begins with a, with what? But. It begins with a conjunction. And what, and is this an independent sentence or is it uh, part of a sentence? In the, in the New King James, as, as I pointed out, it has a period at the end of verse 7, but that's because the tendency for the translators was they tried to make every verse an independent sentence. It's In the Greek, it's not. It's part of uh, what is said in verse 7. So the but throws you back when you're talking about and starting to investigate a verse. There are many, th- many things there that may say, you know, I just can't start in this verse. I have to go back to what precedes it. I have to go back. And so we read in verse 7, and he said to them, 
It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive. So, but is a contrast between the fact that you're not supposed to know certain things, and rather you're supposed to wait and receive power from the Holy Spirit. It's not for you to focus on uh, a calendar. But we have two more basic questions, and what would that be? In verse 7. They're really obvious, so you've already answered them, but I'm forcing you, you have to ask the question, what are they? No. Who's them? Who's he? Him. Okay, who's he and who are them? So that means you have to go further back in the context, and also he's speaking to, he's speaking to somebody, so we have to understand something about the dialogue that's taking place here. Um, verse 6, we go back further. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying. So they ask a question, and he's answering the question. The question he's asking is, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he's saying, don't worry about the timing. He doesn't correct them, their understanding of a literal geopolitical kingdom, does he? The only thing he's correcting them on is their concern about the timing. But what? How does verse six begin? Therefore, therefore, what does that mean? What is it therefore? Yeah, what's it therefore? So you got it's a conclusion of something. So that means you, you, you we still can't get directly into Acts one eight because we're still being thrown back further. In the context, so the therefore comes from something he said before. And this takes us back to verse 4, being assembled together with them. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So he's telling them to wait in Jerusalem. Well, doesn't that relate to Acts 1.8, where he says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So verse 5, he's saying, you shall be back. Uh, he's saying, um, in verse, verse 4, uh, wait for the promise of the Father, which is as stated in verse 5 to be this, the baptism by the Holy Spirit. Again, we're, we still haven't, the only identification we have for him is Lord in verse 6, so in order to answer that question and to understand something about the fact that he, they raise a question about restoring the kingdom of Israel, we have to go back even to verse 3 where we're told that, at, that he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So how what what had Je- what did Jesus teach them between the time of the resurrection and the time of that he goes to heaven? He's giving them instruction on the kingdom of God. So after they've heard all of this instruction on the kingdom of God, what's their question? Is this the time? Okay? Then uh but verse 3 is part of a sentence that goes back to verse 1. So so as we work our way back, we have to look at the whole structure of this chapter in the broad perspective to drill down to understand Acts 1.8. So it starts off the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So what, what, are we, what do we see here? It's a continuation of something because he talks about the former account. Now, this is one of the fun things that I I like to do with with my Lagos is that you have all kinds of ways in which you can highlight things. And I created a new little marker here for time. Though it doesn't, I'm just playing with this. See, it threw the clock so far forward. I need to change that. It's in the other word, so you don't really see it. But. It's a time statement, the former account. And so what's the former account? 
Luke. It's, a, it's the Gospel of Luke. And he wrote Luke to Theophilus as well. But if you're just reading Acts, you don't have a lot of background, what would be the next thing you would look up? Or the next question you would want to answer? Yeah, who's the I and who's Theophilus? So you could look up Theophilus. Where would you find out information about Theophilus? Bible dictionary. You go to your Bible dictionary. In some cases, a study Bible might have the answer, but you look that up in a, in a Bible dictionary. And he's continuing the same thing he was doing in, in, uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke, which is focus, focusing on what Jesus uh, did and what Jesus taught. Okay, that gives you an idea of something to do. Now, what I want you to do, that gets you thinking a little bit. I want you to, during the break here, we're going to take about a 15-minute break, and I want you to look at Mark chapter 11. Mark 11, starting in, starting in verse 27. Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. Read from 27 through 1244. Now, this is more narrative, but there's a lot of different things going on here. So, obviously, we're not going to drill down in, in, in this like you would if we were just looking at one verse. Because I want you to look at the bird's eye view of what's happening in this lengthy narrative here. We're looking at quite a number of... Uh, uh, quite a number of verses, but I want you to think in terms of structure, okay? So you can, I want you to read it. We'll take, we're going to, like I said, 15 minute break. We'll come back about uh, a few minutes before uh, seven, and then we'll start talking about it. But, uh, and I'm going to, and just jot down, have your notebook out and start jotting down things that you, that you notice and that you see, okay? Any questions? This is our break. Yeah. Yes, this, this is the break. <laughs> this is the break. You can get up, go get some water, go get some coffee, go to the bathroom, whatever. You have 15 minutes. Just read as much as you can and start writing some things down that, that you uh, begin to see or things you want, think should be investigated, questions you might have, things like that. But look for patterns. Look for things that are repeated, things that are emphasized, things that are, are and how the structure is going. And then we'll start... Uh, to focus a little more on it. Long section, a lot going on there now. Uh, right after we took the break, when the video was off and they were rebooting, Barb had done a quick search and found a picture depicting a literal image of the woman in the Song of Solomon. And Judy asked a very perceptive question, How, and which is one that has tripped up a lot of people. How do you determine what the point of comparison is when you're using uh, various similes and metaphors. One way is just to list the various characteristics that you can. For example, in the imagery here, you see that her, um, her hair is like a flock of goats. It's not like an individual goat. It's, the comparison is with the, the whole flock, and it has, so you can think in terms of color, size, smell, uh, quality. You know, there, there's all different areas that you say. He's describing a beautiful woman, so where would the comparison be? Would it be color 
or would it be movement, flowing? Uh, and that would probably be uh, the way to do that. Now, that's one way to look at uh, how you analyze things. There's a lot of different um, metaphors, similes in the, in, in the Psalms and in uh, poetry that relate to uh, animals, relate to uh, various flora. And so, uh, in fact, I have a book at home on flora and fauna in the Bible, and that was pro- came out in the, in the 70s, so there's probably more updated material. There's other books on imagery in the Bible. There's a whole encyclopedia of imagery in the Bible put out by InterVarsity Press. Uh, another <clears throat> tool that probably is much larger than anything you ever imagined, but this uh, small little book here, let me... Uh, hold up something on the video for perspective. Here's a pen. So you can see this book is about two and a half, three inches thick called Figures of Speech Used in the Bible Explained and Illustrated. And the table of contents, which lists all the different figures of speech conceivable to mankind, begins on page... You see here, figure the table of contents, a summary of class, classification begins on page uh, 19 and goes through page 66. So you have, how, what's that going to be? Like 47 pages of table of contents listing all the different figures of speech conceivable. You never learned anything. I I mean, I never learned anything like that. I was an English major, part of a double major. Never heard anything like this. So I'm... So, that's one thing. Other things, there are books like this. Again, this book... Not sure when this came out. 1983, called How to Use New Testament Greek Study Aids. And there's several different types of books like this that list different study aids and just give you an idea of the different kind of tools that are out there and summarizes them. And then you have other books like this one, uh, which was put out by Walk Through the Bible Ministries called Talk Through the Bible, which is a new survey of the setting and content of Scripture. And it lists every book of the Bible, it's a lot like a Bible handbook, and it gives you an introduction and a chart of the organization and structure of the book, and then it'll give you inform- basic information about introduction, title, author, date, setting, time, I mean the theme and purpose, and a little survey and overview of, of each book of the Bible. But those kinds of things are very helpful. You have them. There's, there, there's a lot of them. That's, that's one that's, that's fairly good. Okay. Now let's go back to our passage in uh, Mark, if I can see if I can grab this, make it a little larger. Okay, we're looking at Mark chapter 11, starting in verse uh, 20, 27. Now... I want some of y'all to tell me, what are some of the things that you noticed, some of the things you observed about the overall structure? Because this is a a long section that has uh, 51 verses. So what did you notice about structure? Anything? You really have to pin down the pronouns. Excellent observation. You really have to pay attention to your pronouns. And pay attention and define who who those pronouns are. Who are the they's? Who the he's? Who the the them? Uh, who's talking to whom? Okay. What else did you notice? Everybody, all the religious groups are represented. Very good observation. All the religious groups are mentioned. Uh, you have the and what are those? Pharisees, Sadducees, Scribes, Herodians. What else did you know? A lot of uh, back and forth, right? And okay, you got a lot of dialogue. But but our Lord... You got a lot of challenging... Right, but He doesn't address them directly, right? So there, yeah. you know, there's this kind of... Um, 
dodging, if you will, right? Doesn't and answer you the know the question. answer to this. Why are you asking me this question? Yeah, he, he doesn't, and, and which is another good observation, he doesn't always validate their question by answering their question. Just because, and what, what's the application? That's right, that verify the presuppositions. Very good. Very good. That just because somebody asks you a question doesn't mean you need to answer it. We all feel compelled. Somebody, especially somebody who is uh, opposed or critical of Christianity, asks a question that we should answer it. And what we learn is that that's not what Jesus did. But but we see dialogue and and what what's the atmosphere? What's the mood here? What's the what's the tone? What do we see? Hostility, hostility and confrontation. Okay, Jeff. Well. It, there is hostility, but it's interesting that, you know, here are the scribes and the Pharisees, right, the experts. But when our Lord says, answer me, they all run around and go, oh, but we need to think about what this guy's saying. Yeah. Right? Right. You know, usually if you go up to an expert and say, hey, answer me, he's like, hey, get out of here. So, you know, he has, they know something's going on there. Yeah. On top of that, the very thing that they're supposed to be experts in, he tells them from the scriptures. Right. He, he challenges them from this. He's always going back to the Scripture. He's always challenging for them from the Scripture, which always points us to scriptural authority. Now, let... Franklin. His answers, he would show the flaws in their own thinking. By answering them back, he would... So they couldn't answer because he would expose to them that their own thinking was flawed. His answers are very sophisticated, and, and they're fairly simple. Answer their questions. He just didn't answer it in a direct answer. He did well, right. Well, sometimes he, uh, the first one, he doesn't answer. You don't think right. He refuses to answer the answer. first one. No, not to, not to the first one, because because you, what you, you you have here, you've got a series of interchanges with different people. Okay, you got close to that in your observation. He deals with every religious group, but is there a structure to that? And we'll come back to that question in a minute because so far, one of the most important rules for observation hasn't surfaced yet. Okay? The verse, be- the, the section begins, then they came again to Jerusalem. Yeah, but there's something even more basic. What, 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 did, how, many pe- how many people went back to the verses before? How many of you went back and read verses uh, 1 through 26 in chapter 11? I didn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to get through the side reading. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's really important in almost every situation is you just start off in this verse, then they came again to Jerusalem. What is what? What do you learn just from that phrase? And what are the questions you want to ask? What were they doing the first time? When was the first time? Yeah, they came again, which means they'd been there before. So what happened the first time? Another question would be, who's they? And uh, and you have to identify that. And to identify that, you have to go back. How far? See, I, I've sort of done this for you here. I started going through here using some markup. Then they came again. This is a time word indicating a second time to Jerusalem. Now the underline here, the double green underline indicates a place. So we want to see that. So they're coming again to Jerusalem. So that drives you back a little bit just to find the they. You come back and in the... um, Previous section, we, we see I and you, but we can't identify the they yet. In fact, we go back to verse 20, and what do we read? In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look. So Jesus, this is the first time we are introduced to uh, Jesus. So we have the they and Jesus. When do we find out? How far back do we have to find out to, <clears throat> who's with him? 
Verse 11, Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. That's the first time we can nail down who is, who's exactly with him. So we go all the way back to, uh, to verse 11. Now, here's another question. When, very important, when is this taking place? Didn't he only go there for the peace days? Yeah, you, you can figure it out better than that. Palm Sunday. Yeah, that's right. This is right a, a, after the triumphal entry. So this is taking place in the last week before the crucifixion. That's really important because he, Mark and the and the and the other writers aren't just giving us another example of this is how the religious leaders just can't understand what Jesus is doing. What is going to happen later that week? Crucifixion. Crucifixion. Who gets crucified? Christ. And Christ is who? Jesus. Is Jesus. What's another term for Jesus? Another title for Jesus? He is the what John John the Baptist called, John the Baptist said he was the Lamb of God. What is fulfilled? What is fulfilled on the day that he's crucified? What Old Isaiah. Testament event? What typology is what typology is fulfilled on the day on what day on what day is Christ crucified? Passover. 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 Yeah. What is fulfilled? What's the picture on what happens on Passover? The lamb is sacrificed. What are the qualifications for the lamb? In Passover, what? Yes, without spot or blemish. When is the lamb chosen? The lamb is chosen five days, four days before Pentecost. Why? For inspection. For inspection. So what's happening between 1127 and 1244? Inspection. Inspection. The religious leaders are inspecting Jesus. This is, the, this is when they're running him to the grill. It's, it's what we looked at like this morning in Matthew. We're looking at Satan taking, or, or the Holy Spirit leads Jesus out in the wilderness, and then Satan tempts him. And this is to show the initial uh, evidence of his messiahship before he begins his ministry. Well, we have another evaluation that takes place right before he goes to the cross. And that's what we see here is he, his evaluation from the religious leaders. But they don't know they're really doing that. What, right, they, right. They don't understand that that's what they're doing, but that, that's what they're doing. He enters in on uh, in the triumphal entry, this is the presentation of the Lamb or the selection of the Lamb. Then it's followed. It all fits the typology. Then it's followed by the evaluation of the Lamb and then the uh, sacrifice of the Lamb. So <clears throat> we have this picture that, that takes place here. Where's Jesus staying? Right, he's staying at, at Bethany, which is up on the Mount of Olives, which isn't very far from from Jerusalem. This is about two miles, two to three miles from the uh, from the temple. So they would spend the night there, and then they would go into Jerusalem uh, the next day. He goes into Jerusalem. Let's see if I can find the one I did earlier. Here we go. I've been wanting to use this for a long time. First time I went to, to Israel in 2006, we're on the southern steps of the Temple Mount, and there's this enormous fig tree. First thing I thought of was this passage in, in, um, in, Luke, or in, in, in Mark here. In the morning as they passed by, they saw a fig tree dried up from the roots, and Peter remembered, saying to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has, has withered away. So the cursing of the fig tree was back in verse 12. He saw a fig tree without leaves. So I don't want to get into that, but I've been looking for that. I found the picture the other day, and I said, ah, i got to make a slide out of that. That's a great picture of a fig tree that's right there on the uh, southern steps of, of the Temple Mount. 
Okay, so we go to our verse. We've looked at some background issues so far, and then we read, Then they, the disciples and Jesus, came again to Jerusalem. So they've uh, been there. We have time markers. What are the time markers? There's the triumphal entry that begins in uh, 11 1. Okay. Verse 12. Now, the next day, so this is the, the, the first day they enter, the second day, the next day, when they'd come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And this is when he curses a fig tree in verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem. This is still the next day. Jesus goes into the temple, cleanses the temple, drives out the money changers. And what happens? He gets a confrontation with the scribes and the chief priests. So they decide to see how they can destroy him and uh, because they feared him. Then, verse 20, now in the morning. So you ought to be under, underlining these time phrases. The, there's the first day, there's the next day, verse 12, then in the morning. So this would be the second day after the entry. Uh, it's when they they come in, they see the, the fig tree. And then verse 27, they came again to Jerusalem. So this would be like the third day. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple... Um, Who confronts him? The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. So what do you want to do at this point? Look up in a Bible dictionary who these guys are. Yeah, who who are these guys? What's the difference between these these three groups? It's just the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. So the chief priests would involve the upper echelon of the priesthood, not just the high priest, but the upper echelon of of the priesthood. The scribes, these are those who are writing. And what I would do also is to look up those three groups to see where they show up previously in confrontations with Jesus. So there's these three groups, and they came to him, and they, they questioned him. Now, I'm not going to get into, at this point, the details of the question and answer, but they, it's very sophisticated how Jesus handles this. <clears throat> they ask him a question, by what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus doesn't tell them. He says, I'll answer your question if you answer my question. And so then he raises a question, very sophisticated, um, you, you answer this, and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And so they have to go into a little huddle because they have to think about how are we going to answer this because if we, they say it's from heaven, then they're going to say, well, why don't you believe? Why didn't you believe him about me? If it's from heaven, then I must be who I claim to be. And if we say it's from men, then they fear the people because the people believe John, who's popular, and they're going to revolt against the religious leaders. So he asks them a question that they don't want to answer. And so as a result, Jesus says, well, then if you don't want to give me an answer, then I'm not going to tell you uh, by what authority I do these things. So he doesn't answer that question. Then what happens in verse 1? Okay, then he, of course, that's Jesus, began to speak to them in parables. Who's them? The disciples. Is it? No, the chief, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Yeah, it's the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And he goes through and he gives a parable. A man planted a vineyard, set a hedge around it, dug a place for a wine vat. So he builds all of these things, and then at, at vintage time, he sends a servant to the vine dressers, that he might get some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. They took, but they took the servant and they beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant, and they threw stones at him. And then again he sent another, and they killed him. Uh, therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them. Last, saying, "They will respect my son." But those vine dressers said among themselves. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So he took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected 
uh, has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Obviously, he, the the point of the of the parable is what? Okay, who's the owner? Of the, who's the owner of the vineyard? Who's the man who planted the vineyard? God the Father. That's God the Father. Okay, who are the vine dressers? Israel. Uh, the, 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 the spiritual leaders of Israel. The spiritual leaders of Israel. And they've been given that, that uh, uh, delegated that responsibility. So this, who, who are the servants that are sent who are beaten, stoned, killed? Prophets. Prophets of the Old Testament. And so at the end, he sends his son, which is obviously the Lord Jesus, and they kill him and... Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He's going to come and destroy the... There's going to be judgment on the vine dressers, which means God's going to judge the religious leaders for their uh, rejection of Jesus. And then he makes the application uh, in the last part of 10 and 11 uh, from uh, from the Old Testament. So, um, verse 12, they, and they what, what's, their, what's their response? They're angry. They sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken. And so Jesus is just ratcheting up the confrontation and the opposition. Now, how many times would we be told, no, you, sh- you just just calm things down. You know, you don't want to have a whole lot of opposition here. And he's telling the truth, and the truth divides. He's not doing it in a hostile, confrontational manager he, manage, management that's, that's just throwing gas on the fire he is simply describing the, the the truth and the truth and they can't handle the truth so now we come to the next little episode then they who's they they sent to him they sent to him who's they the chief priests and the scribes probably the chief priests the scribes and the elders so they've been shot down, so they're going to send in the, the next team, the Pharisees and the Herodians. So what do you want to do with that? Yeah, find out who they are. It's an interesting connection of, of individuals here because the Herodians are the, the more the secular power, so they've got the religious leaders and the Pharisees, the conservative religious leaders, and the Herodians, and they, they want to trap... Uh, Jesus by his word. So when they had come, they said to him, that would be the Pharisees and the Herodians, and they call him teacher. We know that you're true and care about no that, well, that you are true and care about no one. For you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes or not? So now they're coming up. They think they want to. They're going to try to come up with a question that's going to trap him. So that he's going to answer in a way that will um, uh, that will anger the multitude, right? Because if he answers that, that if he answers one way that, it, that that yeah it's okay to pay taxes, and he sounds like he's pro taxation, that's going to anger all the people because they're overtaxed, like we are, and. Um, but if he says, don't pay the taxes, then he's in opposition to Rome, and that puts him in a position of treason. So they're trying to trap him that way. And so, again, Jesus is very sophisticated in the way that he handles this, and he says, bring me a denarius. And he says, whose image is on this? And they say, well, Caesar. So, well, give Caesar what's due to Caesar. So he, you know, he avoids the whole trap and doesn't get sucked into their agenda. There are a lot of things we can learn about this in terms of having dialogues with with unbelievers, dialogues with anybody who's in opposition. And then we come to the next confrontation. What's the next confrontation? Sadducees. Sadducees. So we've seen different groups here that that come before Jesus we see the chief priests elders and the um, and the um, scribes second we see the pharisees and herodians third the sadducees and the sadducees come and they say and sadducees don't believe in the resurrection or an afterlife that's why they're sad you see yeah, so you'll <laughs> never forget that um, they say there's no resurrection they come to him and they pose a question 
And see, they don't believe in the resurrection at all or any afterlife. And they say, okay, Moses said that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind then <clears throat> and has no children, that his brother should take that wife and raise up offspring for his brother. So this is a situation called leveret marriage, which is uh, outlined in the, in the Mosaic Law. And they come, come up with this extreme uh, hypothetical situation that there's seven brothers, and the first took a wife who died, and he left no offspring. And then the second brother comes along, and he dies, uh, nor did he leave any offspring. The third likewise. So the seven, seven had her and left no offspring. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? See, that's the question they ask. The other question to ask is, this is suspicious. What poison is she using? <laughs> but she is, um, so they're asking this question, and Jesus, Jesus says, um, you know, avoids the whole trap. Says He doesn't validate their, their assumption because it's, it's silly to begin with. Um, and he questions, he says, you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you? And see, now he goes to the real issue. The real issue is you don't believe in resurrection, but haven't you read Moses? Um, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So therefore, you're greatly mistaken. I mean, he just cuts the foundation of their theology out from under them. So in, with each group, he basically exposes uh, th their fraudulent motivations and their, their false theology. Then we have a scri another scribe come. Then one of the scribes, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him. So we have one smart scribe here who thinks he's going to uh, ask a, a, a better question. And he says, which is the first commandment of all? And so he goes, he, he asks the question, and then there's an interesting interchange with this scribe. Jesus gives the answer that the, the first of the commandments is the, love the Lord your God <clears throat> with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe says, well said, teacher, but you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he, to love him with all the heart, understanding, soul, etc., as more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And so apparently this last scribe, it seems, is not antagonistic. And he, he seems uh, close to figuring things out. And then verse 35, Then Jesus answered and said, uh, while he taught in the temple, how is it that this... Now Jesus answers the question to addressing these religious leaders. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David said, by the Holy Spirit, and he quotes from Psalm 110, and the people hear him gladly at the end of verse 37. So the, the leadership's in opposition, but the people are listening to him. Um, then verse 38, then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places of feasts, feasts who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. They will receive greater con congregation. Now, Verse 41, he goes on, he sat opposite the treasury, saw the people put money in. So in Jesus' responses here, uh, he starts to, uh, exp again, continues to expose their hypocrisy and to point out uh, the positive uh, in terms of how it should be, contrasting the, uh, the desire for attention and power on the part of the scribes with the uh, with the woman who, in poverty and anonymity, uh, gives out of her out of her poverty. So, by looking at this as a, as an overall study, what we have to do is understand that each of these individual episodes fits within a broader context of the religious leaders all challenging Jesus in terms of, of his credentials 
and wanting to uh, want, wanting to uh, find a basis for condemnation, and how Jesus uh, continuously goes to the Scripture and addresses their their issues or avoids them in very sophisticated manners. So when you get when we get to the next section, we start talking about interpretation. This is one of the ways in which observation leads into interpretation is that once we observe this kind of pattern or structure, we have to ask the question, well, what does that mean? Why has Mark arranged this material in this way? What is he trying to communicate by the arrangement of this material? And, you know, earlier when I asked the question about Passover and I was pointing out that that's that's an interpretation that's an <coughs> that's going to the next level saying what does this mean but that flows out of going into the text and asking these various questions about um, when does it occur who's involved what do they believe what is the progression of events that's going on here and you know we we can get into some of the specifics and details of these different things that are described, but if we don't see it in the framework of the pattern, then we miss what's really going on. Because the, the, So we have to constantly in the study of Scripture go up and get that bird's eye view, understanding the overall structure and the flow of the, what the writer is saying, and then focusing down on, on the details. Anybody have any questions? this, all of this happened in, in one day so he confronted everybody in the temple on one day? Yeah, yeah. from verse 27 down um, all this happens in one day now the, how, would you t- how would you test that? well I, I was looking over at number 14 it says after two days and I only told us to look at the right. days, and then I saw day one, I saw day two, he was in the temple, he moved, he looked across from the temple, and then he went out of the temple to the Mount of, uh, Mount of Olives, which was across from it, and then it says, after these two days, so all this takes place in one day. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, and then then you go on from this, and what happens after this in chapter thirteen is he went out of the temple. The disciple says, "Well, what? Take a look at the the temple." And he points out that, "Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down." Now, a question that somebody asked me years ago, and um, and I didn't know the answer at the time said, well, well, you have the, the Western Wall, otherwise known as the, the Wailing Wall, and you, and, and you look at the stones that are there, and there are still stones left on top of each other from the first century. Well, doesn't Jesus say that all the stones are going to be torn down, not one stone left on top of another? How can, how can that be? How do you answer that from the text? It's, it's a metaphor. It's a yeah, that's the, the, what's left is the, the restraining wall of the foundation that was what Herod built, and what Jesus is talking about is the buildings, not the the, the restraining wall. This was just a uh, the wall that was put up around the temple platform to hold all the dirt and everything there to support the weight of the temple up on the temple mount. It wasn't part of the temple uh, precinct at all. So, okay. Now we're going to shift gears to go into the next section, and that's going to be on interpretation. And I I don't think I've put down in the uh, syllabus what we should do for um, for reading, but we've got about three weeks, so I want you to read through chapter twenty seven. 28, I structured this, and 29. <clears throat> 27, 28, and 29. Max. Of, no, of Hendrick's book, Living by the Book. We're going to do 27, uh, we'll cover 
in December 27, 28, 29, the first, uh, the first time we meet, which is the 8th, then on the 15th, 30 through 32, and then on the, um, yeah, the 15th is 30 to 32, and then the 22nd, we'll do 33 to 35, and then um, we'll do the last three when the, the first Sunday in February, when I come back. And then we'll probably do the rest of it in three chapter sections, wrapping up about the, right at the end of right at the end of February. So that's the plan. Hmm. What day is after the eighth? The fifteenth. Okay, let me just just give it to you. I'll, I'll post this, but for for the eighth, twenty seven to twenty nine. For the 15th, 30 to 32. And for the 22nd, 33 to 35. And, the, you know, to get the most out of this, since we're not going to be meeting for a couple of weeks, is to look at the comparable uh, sections in the workbook... which starts in, in chapter 45, why do we need interpretation? And you could just work through as many of these uh, chapters as you, as you want to. I would see, let's say, uh, we've got... Okay, in the workbook... Okay, it's roughly about the same number of chapters in the in the workbook as we have in the um, in the textbook. So just do three workbook sections, just like we're, I was assigning three chapters for the next meeting. Just do the first three chapters of interpretation: forty five, forty six, and forty seven. Uh, do forty eight. I think that works right. For, do through forty eight. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, chapters twenty seven to twenty nine for the next time. And 45 to 48 in the workbook. And just do as much, I mean, these workbook exercises don't take a lot of time. Most of them are related to spending about 30 minutes uh, on each of these assignments. So especially with the next two weeks off, you can probably um, just take about 15 or 20 minutes each day and you can uh, work through and give, put even more time into it. That's the thing about Bible study is you can always get something out of it, and you can spend 15 minutes on it, or you can spend three or four hours on, on, on each assignment. Okay? And, there's, and where we're headed in the interpretation, which we won't get to till I get back from Kiev, Judy, is there's a section there on figuring out the figurative so that you can read ahead for coming attractions if you want. See what Hendrick says about figuring out the figurative. Okay? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time that we've had to study through these things and to reflect upon how to read your word, what to look for. Pray that you'll just open our eyes that we can see uh, what you have revealed to us in your word. Father, thank you for each one who's here, each one that's watching, and their desire to become better students of your word and to read it more intelligently and more knowledgeably and learn how they can uh, push themselves to study the Word uh, for themselves. Father, we just pray that over the next couple of weeks, as we spend time with uh, family, f- spend time with friends and family over Thanksgiving, that uh, it'll be great opportunities for us to share some of the things we've learned and to uh, be a w- witness and testimony to our family members and friends. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.